I want to talk to you this morning about the secret of God's presence. If you would turn in your Bible to John chapter 6, there are secrets that are hidden in the Word of God, and they come line upon line, precept upon precept, a little here and a little there. But in the wilderness, God fed his people with manna. It was bread that came down from heaven. That manna was symbolic of the true bread that God would later send to the church. We're reading from John chapter 6, beginning in verse 32. Then said Jesus unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father, look at this, giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth his life unto the world. Glory. Then they said unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. I like that. Evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Church, we need the true bread. We need Jesus. We need him in our lives. We need him in order to satisfy our hungry souls. And Jesus is the bread of life. And this word, it is bread to our souls. My subject this morning, the secret of God's presence. Let us pray. Father, thank you so much for the anointed singing. Thank you for your presence here today. Holy Spirit, I ask you to illuminate our hearts and our minds. I ask you to convict the sinner and the saint. I ask you, Lord, to give us a greater hunger, a greater desire, a greater thirst for righteousness. I ask you, Lord, to work that very work in my heart. And, Lord, I praise you for the anointing to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ. Holy Ghost, take over, speak through me, make me that vessel that you call me to be. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody said, Amen. Amen. You know, Jesus, he lived a life with purpose. And the purpose of his life was to please the Father and to do the Father's will. He knew the secret to God's presence. And today, I want to examine this subject. How do we enter into God's presence and how do we abide in his presence at all times? Jesus said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, point number one is abiding in the word. He said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask whatsoever you will, and it shall be done unto you. Now, that's a big order. You can ask anything if you're walking in the will of God and abiding in his word, and he will do it. Amen. What was the secret of the early church? Have you ever wondered what it was? Was it their music program? Was it their praise and worship? No, those things are important. But they were not the major things. The apostle said, we will give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. I love to sing. I love to praise them. I'm a praise and you know that. But I'm going to tell you what I really give myself to. It is study of the word and the ministry of the word. Faith grows by reading the word. And faith thrives in an atmosphere of prayer. Jesus had a close, intimate relationship with the Father. He had that close, intimate relationship because he spent hours praying and talking to the Father. Intimacy, it begins with prayer and communion with the Father. Jesus was always talking to the Father, or he was telling someone about the Father. He taught his disciples to pray, how to pray to the Father. He told the woman at Jacob's well to worship the Father in spirit and in truth. He prayed at Lazarus' tomb, Father, I thank you that you hear me, that you always hear me. Hallelujah. He said, the Father has sent me. He said, he that honoreth the Son honoreth the Father which sent me. All through the Gospels, we see Jesus complete devotion, and his obedience to the Father. Two key words, 
his devotion and his obedience to the Father. He knew the secret of abiding in God's presence. Jesus was so completely devoted to pleasing his Father that he prays, standing in the shadow of the cross, Father, if it be possible, let this cup of death pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And when Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, look at what Jesus said in John 14 and 9. Jesus said unto him, Have I been with you so long, and yet thou hast not known me, Philip? Said, He that has seen me has seen the Father. And how says thou, then show us the Father? Jesus said, Philip, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He said, Philip, when you have seen me, if you can understand who I am, you will get a revelation of all that God is and all that God has. And if you want that same type of relationship, church, with the Father, then you must hunger and thirst for righteousness and for more of Jesus. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you want to know the Father, you've got to know the Son. And my mind went to John and his beautiful relationship that he had with Jesus and the Gospel of John in which he paints us a beautiful portrait of Christ. He gives us 21 chapters who describe who Jesus is. In John chapter 1, he's portrayed as the Son of God. In John chapter 2, he's portrayed as the Son of Man. He's the God-man, 100% God, 100% man. As a man, he grew hungry, and, but as God, he could take a few fishes and loaves and break them, thank the Father, and feed the multitudes. As a man, he grew tired. He went to sleep in the hinder part of a ship out there on the Sea of Galilee. But as God, he arose, he rebuked the wind and the waves, and they laid down at his voice, and the disciples marveled and said, Never a man spake as this man spake. Amen. Jesus is the God-man, 100% God and 100% man. And if you want to know the Father, then you've got to know the Son. In John chapter 3, he's portrayed as the divine teacher. As Nicodemus, a Jewish rabbi, he comes to him by night and said, We know that thou art a man sent from God. And Jesus cut right through the crux of the matter. He said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. You may be religious, but Nicodemus, you must be be born again. In John chapter 4, he's portrayed as the soul one of the great evangelist who goes to a wayward woman at Jacob's well, and he tells her about some living water. And he said, if you take one drink of this water, you will never thirst again. She said, sir, give me to drink. She took one drink. She went running through the city. What was her message? Come see a man. Come see a man that told me all the things I ever did is not this the Christ. Hallelujah. John chapter 5, he's portrayed as the great physician when he heals a lame man at the pool of Bethesda. For 38 years he had sat by that pool waiting for the angel of the Lord to come and stir up the water. And the first one that got in that pool was healed. And Jesus walks down into that area. And he says, Sir, I have no man to put me in the pool. But Jesus heals him. And he gets up and he walks. You know, it always makes a difference when Jesus passes by. If you want to please the Father, praise God, get to know the Son. That's power in the blood. That's power in that name. We've already sang about it, and I'm preaching a whole lot better than you're praising God right now. Let's take a praise break. Go on and praise him. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. In John chapter 6, he's portrayed as the bread of life, the living bread that came down from heaven to save and redeem fallen man. He saves, he heals, he delivers, and he satisfies. In John chapter 7, he's portrayed as the water of life. Jesus said, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scriptures have said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. This spake he of the Spirit, which they that believed on him should receive. Come get another barrel of the Pentecostal phenomenon tonight. I'm going to talk to you about the Holy Ghost that Jesus sent to his church. 
In John chapter 8, he's portrayed as the defender of the weak. And he tells a woman who has been caught in adultery, your sins are forgiven you. Go and sin no more. In John chapter 9, he's portrayed as the light of the world. And he demonstrates his right to this distinction by giving light and sight to a man who was born blind. In John chapter 10, he's portrayed as the good shepherd who watches over his sheep with infinite care. In John chapter 11, he's portrayed as the resurrection and the life, and he proves his right to that title by raising Lazarus from the dead. In John chapter 12, he's portrayed as the king. As he comes into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, and the people begin to proclaim him as the king of the Jews. And the crowd, they began to shout, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. He is the Lord that saves. But I want to tell you, he's a king, all right, but he's not just the king. He's the king of kings, and he's the Lord of lords. Is he your savior today? Then go on and praise him for his amazing grace and what he's done in your heart and in your life. In John chapter 13, he's portrayed as the servant. When he condescends and he humbles himself and he washes his disciples' feet. And he said, if you know these things, happy are you if you do them. And the servant of all is the greatest of all. Do you want to be great in God's eyesight? Do you want to be great in the kingdom? Then become a servant. Get a servant's heart just like Jesus had. In John uh, chapter 14, he is portrayed as the consoler. He's standing in the shadow of the cross, and he tells his disciples, I must depart. I've got to go to the cross. I've got to return to the Father. And he said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Glory to the Lamb. This is not all there is. Hallelujah. There's a heaven waiting for those that love him, who serve him. Glory to God. Eyes not seen, ears not heard, not even in the hearts of man, the things God has prepared for those that love him. In John chapter 15, he's portrayed as the true vine. He said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. Here's that word abide again. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Amen. And church, as we abide in him, the same divine life that is in him, it abides in us. The same glory that's in him. The same substance. That's the sameness of being attached to him. And when you realize that, praise God, you begin to walk in the spirit of the living God. In John chapter 16, he's portrayed as the giver of the Holy Ghost. He said, it's necessary for your sake that I go away. Because if I don't go away, I cannot send the spirit, the comforter to you. That he may abide with you forever. You see those words, abide. God wants us to abide in him. And Jesus sent the Holy Ghost to his church. So we could have that privilege of constantly abiding in him. In John chapter 17, he's portrayed as the great intercessor. As he prays his great intercessory prayer for all of those that would follow him. And he prays, Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And then he prays, and for their sake I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified. That word sanctified it means to be set apart for a particular purpose, and it also means to be made holy as he is holy. In John chapter 18, he's portrayed as the model sufferer. We find him in the garden once again. What is he doing? He is praying. He said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. He said, I have come to do thy will, O God, for in the volume of the books it is written of me. Three times he prays, Father, if it be possible, let this cup of death pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Judas betrays him, 
A band of officers, they arrest him. In fear, his disciples desert him. He is examined before Caiaphas. He is smitten by the soldiers. He is denied by Peter. He is taken before Pilate. He is pronounced innocent. Pilate said, I find no fault in him. You may find fault with the preacher. You may find fault with the church. But I challenge you to find any fault with Jesus. Hallelujah to the Lamb. He said, I find no fault in him. Yet his own people rejected him. And they cried, crucify him. In John chapter 19, he's portrayed as the uplifted Savior. As he nailed to the cross and he's made sin with our sin so that we could be made the righteousness of God in him. Can you see him? He's hanging there suspended between heaven and earth. And he's shedding his precious blood. His life is flowing out of him. He is suffering untold agony. He's hanging there and he is dying for you and me but the grave couldn't handle him and death couldn't hold him and in John chapter 20 he's portrayed as the conqueror of death Jesus died but he didn't stay dead because on the third day up from the grave he arose he arose from the dead and the dark domain and he lives forever with his saints to reign he arose he arose hallelujah Christ arose glory to God He's both the buyer and the price. And he purchased each and every one of us with his own precious blood. And because he lives, we also shall live. And then in John chapter 21, he's portrayed as a restorer of the penitent. penitent. He forgives the sinner. He restores the fallen. Peter had failed him. And Peter had denied the Lord three times. But Jesus welcomes him back into the fold, and he commissioned him to go and preach the gospel. And he said, feed my sheep. Jesus had told Philip earlier, Philip, if you've seen me, Philip, you've seen the Father. If you want to know the Father, church, you must know the Son. Jesus said in the volume of the book, it is written of me. What a beautiful picture John gives us of Christ our Savior in his gospel. Jesus lived to please the Father. Jesus lived to do the Father's will. And that is exactly how you and I must live. Which brings me to my second point. What does it mean to walk in the Spirit? Darken that some brother. What does it mean to walk in the Spirit? See, if we truly desire to win the heart of Christ, it will require a hunger and a submission for each and every one of us to do the Father's will. If you want to win Christ, you must commit yourself to walking in the Spirit. So what does it mean to walk in the Spirit? It means allowing the Holy Spirit to do in you what Christ sent the Holy Spirit to do in you. And what does the Holy Spirit really want to do? He wants to perfect Christ in us so that we can do the work of the ministry. Now, most Christians don't think about them being perfect, but that's the work of the Holy Spirit. He wants to perfect Christ in you, and this revelation will open up to you as I proceed with this message. The Holy Spirit wants to form Jesus Christ in our hearts. He wants to operate his supernatural gifts through us. He wants to form Christ in us so we can be the eternal spotless bride of Christ. He's coming for a church without spot, blemish, and wrinkle. So you need to understand who your perfection is. Amen. Yet people, you know, the Holy Spirit wants to to form Christ in us, yet people have always had a tendency to turn back and to become lax in pursuit of God when they reach the place of fullness of blessings. Amen. See, the nation of Israel, 
They're given to us as an example. We're not to fall into the same trap they fell into. The nation of Israel got to the edge of the promised land, but they never went in. They weren't willing to follow the Spirit's leading at all costs. I said they weren't willing to follow the Spirit's leading at all costs. Now, I read you about Jesus submitting himself to death, even the death of the cross, to please the Father. So he was willing to submit himself to the Father at all costs. Amen. See, Israel, they continued in their stubborn rebellion. They continued in their backsliding. They continued in their idol worship. They were chosen but not cleansed. In other words, they weren't sanctified. They were special, but they never separated themselves from the world and from the ways of the world. And when the time came to enter the promised land, they weren't ready. In the wilderness, their trials, it should have been a place of preparation. Do you know the trying of your faith is precious to God, more precious than gold that perishes? And after you've done the will of the Father, you shall receive the promise. None of us like those hard places, but God is teaching us obedience. And God is teaching us submission. Hallelujah. See, the wilderness should have been a place of preparation. It should have been a place of seeking God's direction. But they learned nothing through their struggle. And when it came to time, time to enter Canaan, the promised land, they weren't ready. What a tragedy. All the time, they were living only for self when they could have known God and they could have known him intimately. This is a picture, church of the modern-day church. We gloat over being chosen and being called of God, yet we don't want the discipline and the rod of correction that comes from the Holy Spirit and from the Word of God. If we did, our attitudes would be different. If we did, we would have a greater desire for holiness, for righteousness, and for living according to God's Word. All this backbiting and gossiping that some people do when they run the church down and run down others in the church, they'd stop it because they would realize they are not pleasing the Father. See, if we wanted to please the Father, we would allow the Holy Spirit to form Christ in us and, and we would search our own hearts and allow Him to search our hearts so we would not become critical of others. Which brings me to my final point, what is the mission of the Holy Spirit? Have you ever wondered? We want gifts. We want to, to, to operate in the gifts of the Spirit. That's not the mission of the Holy Spirit. That is a byproduct of abiding in Christ and worshiping Him and getting to know Him intimately. Amen. Simply stated, the mission of the Holy Spirit is to form Christ in us. Are you hungry for more of God? Are you hungry to know the Father better? Do you want to understand the secrets of God's presence? If so, then you need to consider some questions. Is Jesus the love of your life? Is your love for Jesus growing? Is your heart consumed with a desire to please him are you seeking to do his will completely totally no matter what he calls you to do are you hungry for his word are you willing to follow the lord wherever he may lead you do you seek to walk in the spirit and obey the word of god well if you don't, I need to help you. And if you do, you'll be abiding in his presence. But the Holy Spirit, he has only one message. And he teaches us and he leads us to one central truth. And the American church as a whole has missed it. Not everybody's missed it. But the church as a whole has missed it. And if they had not missed it, our culture, America, would not be in the trouble we're in today. God wants the church to rise up in great glory 
and in great power. Here's what the Holy Spirit teaches. This is the one central truth that he comes to bring. Look at this. You're not your own. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. What? Know you not your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own. Verse 20, for you are bought, bought, bought. Oh, that sunk deep into my heart one day. For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Church, none of us are our own. You are not your own. You've been bought with a price. You have been chosen to be married to Jesus Christ. Every ray of truth in the Bible leads to this one central truth. You are not your own. You are bought with a price. And you and I, we should glorify God in our body and in our spirit, which are God's. That is the mission of the Holy Spirit. And when you realize this truth... It will set you free from the love of things and from the love of the things of this world. Amen. Jesus Christ, he longed to be with the Father. And he belonged to the Father, and he realized that. And when you and I realize we belong to Jesus, that he shed his precious blood, all of those attitudes that you have, you'll say, Holy Spirit, Please form Christ in me. When you walk through the shadows of life and the difficulties, you'll face them with joy unspeakable that's full of glory. And when you face the storms of life, you'll have the peace of God that passeth all understanding because you're abiding in him. And if you abide in him and his word abides in you, you shall ask whatsoever you will. The preacher won't have to ask the Father to give it to you. The deacons won't have to ask the Father to give it to you. You'll say, Father, I have confidence in my heart toward you. I'm abiding in the word. The spirit is working in me. And I may need a brother or sister to help me pray this thing through. But Father, my heart is pure. My heart is clean. I'm abiding in you. I'm obeying you. I'm living the best of my ability, the sanctified life. Hallelujah to the Lamb. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Not gifts. Not your working in the church. Not your singing ability. Some people think they're the only ones that can sing. Some people think they're the only one that can preach. Not my preaching abilities. Not anybody else's preaching abilities. The secret is knowing Christ. See, the gifts and the anointing, they come out of knowing Christ. And I'll tell you something else. It doesn't matter where you are in your growth stage as a Christian because we're all to be growing in grace and knowledge. When you're walking in the Spirit, the best of your ability at whatever stage you're at, and you're submitting to the will of God at that stage, the gifts will work through you. The anointing will flow through you. And you'll understand that as we go a little deeper. Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit, he is to minister Jesus to the church so that the church will fall totally in love with Jesus. And that love will keep us because if we walk in the Spirit, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Why not? Because the Holy Spirit, he is constantly working in our hearts to turn our hearts to Christ. And if we do anything that we think is displeasing. If we say anything that we think is displeasing, the Holy Spirit will check us. Amen. And we'll stop that stuff. Some of you run your church down. I'll just go on and preach it. Some of you kill yourself with your own mouth. 
life and death in the power of the tongue. And they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Get full of the Holy Ghost. Get full of a love for God. And you won't be so critical about others. You'll see your own faults. You'll see your own shortcomings. The closer I get to Him, the more I realize how much I need Him, how much I need Him to work in my heart. I need His grace. Amen. You need His grace. Glory to God. The Holy Spirit, He comes to lead us to Jesus and a desire to know Him more intimately. The Holy Spirit, He works to wean us from the cares of this world and the pleasures of this world. He comes to create in us a longing for more of Jesus. He comes to convict us of everything that would blemish our lives. He comes to turn our eyes from everything that would hinder us in our advancement and to set our affection completely on Christ Jesus our Lord. The Holy Spirit, He has been sent to give us a foretaste of heaven. The presence of the Holy Spirit is a foretaste of what we will enjoy throughout eternity as the eternal spotless bride of Christ. His presence is a foretaste of the everlasting communion and love that we will share with our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And I've been working all this time to get to this one place. And I'm going to close with this because this is the key to your growth and to your confidence in Christ. So you've got to have confidence to enter into the promises. Israel was right there on the edge of the promised land, but they were not seeking God. And they stopped right at the edge when they could have had it all. This is the key to your confidence. For all the promises of God in Christ are yes. And the amen is spoken by us to bring glory to God. Even when you're exercising your faith and you haven't obtained the promise, if you're using your faith, it pleases God. And he says, just hang on. All my promises are yes. They're all in Christ. And if you get in Christ, if you get in the word, if you walk in the spirit, if you'll abide in him and let my word abide in you, you can ask anything, and you can get it. Have you ever wondered why some of the things you pray you can't get for others? It's because God is working a greater work in their life, chastising them many times because they will not submit and obey the Spirit of God. I'm talking about you getting something when you need it. When you're laying flat on your back and you've got to look up and say, Father, as far as I know, there's no sin in my life. As far as I know, Father, I've sought to do your will. As far as I know, Lord, everything is under the blood. Everything is all right between you and me. And, Father, I have this great need. And I'm coming to you on the line of a living faith. See, if your heart does not condemn you, you have confidence toward God. John said, Beloved, if our hearts condemn us, God is great in our heart and knoweth all things. But see, if there's no sin in your life, submission, obedience, you have confidence toward God. Jesus Christ himself, I want you to see this, though he was the son of God, he had to be perfected. And you watch this. Hebrews 5 and 8. Look at it. Though he was son, yet learned he obedience. Do you see that? By the things which he suffered. Do you see that? He learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Three times he's praying in the garden. He prays the same prayer. Father, if it be possible, let this cup of death let it pass from me. Yes. Nevertheless, Father, not my will, but thy will be done. Do you understand? Do you see? Can you see what he did, what he gave for you and me? Look at verse 9. And being made perfect. Look at that. 
being made perfect. He be, how was he made perfect? Through his suffering. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that what? Obey, Obey him. It became God's will to perfect him. That was the need for it. And it was through his suffering that the work of perfection was accomplished. There was no sin in his life, yet he had to be perfected. He had to be perfected through his suffering in doing the Father's will so that you and I through him could be perfected as we do the Father's will. My Lord, help me, Jesus. And here's what I want you to see. Because if you can see it, this will free you forever. Hebrews 10, 14. For by one offering, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. That's why you need to come back tonight and hear the phenomena that I'm going to preach about. The Holy Spirit being sent. For by one offering... Hath he perfected forever them that are sanctified, them that live holy, so their hearts don't condemn them, so they know they're walking in the will of God, so they don't say things about others, so they don't do wrong things. They are walking to please God, just as Jesus walked to please God. For by one offering he has perfected for them forever, which are sanctified. Do you remember his high priestly prayer? In John chapter 17, he said, Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is true. Father, for their sake I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified. Yet he was a man who had never sinned, who knew no sin, who was made sin with our sin, so we could be made the righteousness of God in him, and we could be perfected by his offering. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Go on and praise him. Amen. That's the meaning of the sacrifice. In the same sacrifice in which he was perfected, he perfected us. <laughs> the devil will tell you that you're not living right. Are you living the best you can? You've got an advocate with the Father. And if you confess your sins, hallelujah, he is faithful and just to forgive your sins and to remove all unrighteousness. And he'll put you right back in the race. In perfection. Hallelujah. As the last Adam, he has made us partakers of his own perfection. See, just as Adam in his death, he corrupted us. Because of Adam's sin, death reigned upon all of us. But Jesus Christ in his death, in which he was perfected, he has perfected us. Amen. Hallelujah. We are the righteousness of God in Christ. And we are perfected in God by Christ. And God the Father looks down and he doesn't see you in your shortcoming. He sees where you are and he sees whether or not you are submissive to his word. Whether or not you are submissive to his will. And no matter where you are in your Christian walk, you're walking in perfection. We were talking about Noah who was perfect in his generation. Yet Noah got drunk. But he was perfect, praise God, because he submitted to God's will. David and others, they walked before God. People after God's own heart, they made their mistake, but they realized their strength was in God and submission to the will of God and obedience to the word of God. Go on and praise him, hallelujah. Glory to God. And here's what I want to tell you. If you will submit your life totally to the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, no matter where you are in your Christian growth, if you will submit to the Holy Spirit, Christ is your perfection. With Him, we die unto sin. In Him, we live unto God. And when you see that, it will radically change your faith level. It will radically change your confidence in God because it's not your perfection. It's his perfection. And he has perfected forever those that are sanctified. And that's important. In him, the consciousness is perfected. So we have no more consciousness of sin. And Paul writes and says, sin shall not have dominion over you. 
Sin has no dominion because we can boldly say Christ is my perfection. Christ is my righteousness. And we can boldly enter into the throne of grace, into the holiest of holies, and obtain mercy and grace to help in our time of need. When your heart is right, can you see what happens when you go into the holiest of holies? That's God the Father, and on his right hand, that's God the Son. And that's a mercy seat in the true tabernacle. And on that mercy seat in heaven, there is the blood of Jesus. And there's power in that blood. And whatever you ask in his name, if you abide in him, and his words abide in you, and you're living the life of submission and obedience, you can go boldly to the throne of grace and obtain mercy and grace or divine favor to help in your time of need. Hallelujah. With him we die unto sin, and in him we live unto God. God himself, church, has perfected us to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight. How does he do it? Through the word, through the spirit, and through Jesus Christ our Lord. And he does that so day by day we're perfected in Christ. And we have confidence in God because our hearts are being conformed to the image of Christ. The mission of the Holy Spirit is to form Christ in us. And as we abide in him, we constantly abide in the Father's presence. Did you hear that? The mission of the Holy Spirit is to form Christ in us. And as we abide in Christ, hallelujah, we constantly abide in the Father's presence. And that's important. Jesus has perfected us. I know you've not heard that preached. Because we don't think we can be perfect. But he's your perfection. If you will go where, from where you are right now and walk in the Spirit, submitting and obeying to the will of God, Jesus was made perfect by submitting himself to the death of the cross and suffering for us so we would not have to suffer. I know it's hard for us to grasp this, but it's a Bible truth. Just as Adam in his death corrupted us, Christ in his death in which he was perfected, he has perfected us. God has accepted us in the beloved, and he has made us heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ because Jesus is our righteousness, and Jesus is our perfection. And that's how you can live in the presence of God. And that's the secret to his presence at all times, day by day, as you walk in obedience and submission to the Father. Let us stand. Hallelujah. Pastor Nick. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love Thank you for the work me, the cross, Lord. a sinner condemned on Thank you for this great salvation. Singing Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Marvelous, how wonderful Thank you, Lord. Song shall Sin. He took my sin and my sorrows. He made them his very he did own. That for you and me. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone.
Father, in Jesus' mighty name, I thank you for the power of the Holy Ghost. Conviction falling on sinners' hearts. Conviction falling on all of our hearts, oh God, as we see our shortcomings and we look into your word and see that our perfection is in you, Lord, that you are righteousness. And Lord, by submitting to the stroke of the cross, to the work of the cross, Lord, we are sanctified, set apart. And Lord, as we obey the word of God, we move in to perfection. Lord, you are perfected through your suffering. And you suffered so we could be free. And Lord, you have perfected forever those that are sanctified through your blood. As he sings that, I want everybody to come to this altar, whatever state you're in. I want you to tell God, God, I want you to perfect me. Lord, if you're not saved, say, God, I want to be saved. I want to be the righteousness of God in Christ. I know my righteousness is as filthy rags, but God, I need you. You paid it all. It's all paid in full, and I can walk in liberty. Sing it, brother. Glory. Glory, glory, glory. We're singing how marvelous, how wonderful and my song shall Perfect wheel. How 